The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have a really eclectic and exciting show tonight. Uh, Professor Alziser, Vice Rector. Rector here is uh, some sort of provost in American University. Yes, I mean, people expect uh, ISIS to disappear, you know, like a phenomenon, storm, something like that. And uh, um, w w when the Americans start bombing them and now the Russians, but they are still with us. Clearly, Russia became a target for uh, these people. I mean, it's ironic that, uh, you know, uh, the whole argument made by Putin uh, to justify the ins Russian intervention in Syria was that, you know, Syria was a defense line for him and uh, in order to protect Russia, he needs to send his troops to fight ISIS there. But actually this intervention didn't prevent ISIS from carrying out attacks against the Russian and uh, actually motivated them and increased their uh, motivation to look for uh, Russian targets and to try to uh, and hit uh, these targets and uh, unfortunately for the Russian that's what is happening right now. Clearly I mean I have doubts about the effect of all these bombings by the Americans, by the Russians. I mean uh, this is not a regular army, this is not a state. So what are really the targets and, and uh, do you have enough information in order to hit uh, directly and exactly in uh, uh, specific uh, targets. I doubt it very much and uh, it seems that he is still with us, this guy. Well, uh, the, the success of ISIS has to do with the weakness of uh, their opponents or their enemies. I mean, uh, there is nobody who can give them a fight. I mean, with all due respect to the uh, American bombing, they really do not uh, change anything on the ground. Uh, there is no one, no effective force that can uh, meet this challenge and fight ISIS, reoccupy, recapture areas uh, occupied by, by ISIS. The Iraqi army is weak and uh, clearly not effective. The Kurds, uh, some Arab tribes focus on defending their own territory, they are not after ISIS in other regions. The Syrian army is weak. Nobody is ready to send its troops to fight ISIS on the ground. And uh, that's why ISIS is still with us. So it's not the strength or the success of ISIS, it's the failure and the weakness of its enemies, yes. It's, it's a very big region, I mean, uh, size of Great Britain or France, half a million kilometers. This is one thing. Second thing, we are not speaking here about a regular army with headquarters, with communication, with aircrafts and tanks. These are mainly, you know, uh, um, civilian uh, uh, cars, uh, some, you know, lorries and... and, and um, warriors that cannot be identified from uh, satellite or from uh, aircraft. I mean, uh, warriors, uh, simply uh, simple people who have a gun or have a rifle and uh, they uh, take part in a, in, in a fight. That's how they operate, you know. They, uh, um, uh, when we speak about their army, we speak about several hundreds, several groups. Each group has, you know, contain of uh, several hundred warriors. It's very difficult to identify them from the above. They don't operate tanks and uh, artillery, and it's 
impossible to, to locate them, and, but they know that the satellites are after them and uh, they don't uh, deploy uh, the forces in a specific place. And for these people it's very high, uh, very easy to hide among civilians in uh, villages, tribes, in the desert. And uh, they can, you know, move from one place to another. And uh, yes, indeed, when uh, they carry out attacks. You can identify, but identify them, but uh, they, it's not a regular army which prepare himself, you know, in advance. And you can see uh, days, uh, you know, uh, the tanks, the uh, um, uh, long lines of uh, tanks, and uh, this is not uh, the case. You know, they suddenly appear and attack a position held by the Syrian army, and that's it. When we speak about ISIS, we don't speak only about, you know, the organization in Iraq and uh, his warriors uh, who operate uh, on the ground in Syria and, uh, um, and uh, Iraq. We, we speak of a supermarket or a net network of, of uh, groups that operate all around the world. Look, for example, at uh, the case of uh, Ansar Beit el Magdis, this is a local group uh, uh, which operates in Sinai, carried out several attacks against Israeli forces, against Egyptian forces, and uh, lately this is probably the uh, group uh, that uh, uh, carried out uh, the, uh, put the bomb in the Russian aircraft. I mean, uh, they are there, they connected themselves to ISIS, and uh, through them, ISIS has now presence in Sinai, so he's more dangerous than he was uh, before. And if he wants to take revenge of the Russians, he don't need to. He doesn't need to look for Russians in Syria, but he can, you know, contact such groups in all around the world. I mean, from Afghanistan to Turkey, uh, Russia itself, of course, North Africa, and they can carry out attacks against local Russian targets in these countries. That's why it's more dangerous than being a local phenomenon. Once again, it's not a question of the strength of the local group which operates in Sinai, it's the weakness of the Egyptian uh, regime and the Egyptian army. Egypt has a serious problem with the local population, the Bedouin tribes, uh, which uh, connected themselves to ISIS and who are ready to operate and, and cooperate with ISIS. That's, that's the problem. But it's not because of or against the ideological background. It's clearly because they have some resentment and complaints um, uh, about the way the Egyptian uh, uh, government treats them. And Egypt, we know, has uh, many problems and has no enough power to deal with, you know, questions like, you know, the presence of these terrorists in Sinai. So the lack of um, any Egyptian authority inside Sinai, the tension between the Egyptian I mean, the Egyptian regime and these tribes, that's what make this organization in Sinai very, uh, very dangerous. Because once again, it's not a question of its success, it's a question of the weakness of the Egyptian authorities. I mean, I mean they follow uh, the model set by uh, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Now, the difference is that Al-Qaeda never uh, had a base of its own, you know, they operated in Afghanistan, they were uh, by uh, the Taliban. This is a uh, uniqueness of ISIS. They have a small, you know, you can say it's not a real state, you can say it's a very primitive state, but they have some sort of a state. And that's what enabled them to be more effective and uh, uh, to influence all uh, the developments all uh, around. That's what makes them more dangerous. First of all, uh, they have weapons uh, which they capture from the Iraqi uh, army and from the Syrian army. Second, they don't need heavy and advanced weapons because the nature of the, the fighting in Syria are mainly wars with a rifle against, you know, uh, uh, local position held by the Syrian army. So. They really don't need advanced weapon. The rifle, you know, the, the, the basic uh, weapon system they have, you know, 
They can get it from the Iraqi army, from the Syrian army to capture it and get it. Or to buy rifles, you know, everybody can buy such weapon uh, in this region. So, so it's not uh, too problematic for them to get uh, uh, such weapon. In September, the Russians uh, got involved. I mean, uh, they took us by surprise. Nobody uh, imagined that the Russian would be ready to send their troops, aircrafts, and to engage, to intervene in such a bloody civil war. We thought that, you know, based on their experience from Afghanistan, they would be very careful not to interfere in, in such a war, but they send their aircrafts, their aircraft start bombing uh, targets of moderate rebels all around uh, uh, the country. In addition, the Iranians sent some of their troops to fight uh, alongside the Syrian army against the uh, rebels, so this is a very significant uh, uh, development. S we still need to wait and see whether it will have any sort of an effect. Um, I mean, because this war, we thought that uh, nobody can decide it on the ground and it can continue forever. Now it seems that uh, the Russians want to um, um, bring it to an end by, by increasing their interference. We need to see whether they are ready to pay the price because the first day, the second day, but now they pay a heavy price. I mean, uh, the aircrafts all around are being bombed by uh, terrorist organization. Uh, we need to see uh, whether they will have casualties inside Syria. This may affect the, the Russian public opinion. So. We still need to wait and uh, see, but if uh, several months ago we had the impression that, well, it's, it, it might be very problematic for Bashar to continue fighting for, you know, another year or two, now it seems that he can, he's more secure at least in his, uh, what we call little Syria, you know, the areas under his control. With the Russian and the Iranian uh, support, but this means probably that the war will continue. I don't know whether it will continue forever, but it can take some more years. He is more secured because of the Russian and the Iranian uh, support, but I don't think that he can defeat the rebels, and the rebels, because of the Iranian and the Russian support, cannot defeat him. So it means this war will continue. If nobody can defeat the other than the question whether somebody will get tired. Or the foreign actors are very important. Without the, Rus the this Russian and the Iranian support, Bashar uh, cannot uh, survive for a long uh, time. And, and, and at the same time, without the uh, Turkish and the Saudi uh, support, uh, the rebels might not be able to continue the, the fight against Bashar. So it's not only the question of whether these groups on the ground in Syria can continue fighting, but what will be the effect on the foreign uh, actors. And if there is a change, it can uh, lead to uh, the victory of one of the sides. ISIS works or fights everyone. He fights the Syrian regime, he fights also the moderate rebel. When we say moderate re rebel, we don't mean secular, we don't mean liberal, we mean uh, Islamist group, but relatively more moderate than ISIS groups that are ready to work with the Americans, with the Saudi, with the Qataris. But when it comes to the question of how to treat uh, prisoners, how to treat minorities, how to treat uh, your wife, there is no big difference, ideological difference between ISIS and these uh, groups, but they are more pragmatic. The, the, the problem with ISIS is not only its military strength, but its ideological influence. I mean, people all around the Arab world, the Sunni world, look at ISIS and uh, they are uh, quite impressed. I mean, because uh, this organization is doing uh, quite uh, well. And when you look at the Shiite challenge, the Russian intervention, the only one who can give them a fight is ISIS. And when we speak about, you know, the all traditional tension between, you know, Islam and the others, 
even the West, well, the only one who now can give a fight on behalf of the Islamic world is ISIS. That's why ISIS is very popular among many, not only Syrians, but Muslims in Europe, uh, Jordanians, Palestinians, Arab Israelis, people in Egypt. I mean, they are all highly impressed by, by, by uh, the conduct of this organization. And once you are highly impressed, then the next step is maybe to join them, maybe to support them. And that's how uh, they uh, became present in, in, in Jordan, in uh, Palestine, even in Israel um, itself. That's the danger. That's the threat. Not that, uh, you know, some of the troops will try to filtrate and, and uh, capture some Jordanian uh, villages. I mean, the Jordanian army is strong enough. But if they can uh, influence the public opinion in Jordan, if they can recruit and mobilize support within, you know, local Jordanians, this can uh, be a serious problem for the stability of this uh, kingdom. Experts do estimate that uh, every month, you know, months, they, they, they uh, get uh, or almost 1,000 volunteers uh, join them. I mean, those volunteers come from Europe, come from Arab states, come from uh, Russia, even among from, from within Muslim communities in in Russia. Clearly, uh, something like that you can't uh, you can't expect that the only place which will not be influenced by by, by this phenomenon will be, you know, uh, the Arab minority in Israel or the Palestinians. Clearly, they are influenced by this. Um, Phenomenon. Uh, it seems that this is uh, second generation, second generation. So their parents came to Europe, immigrated to Europe from Muslim countries, but uh, these are Europeans who were born in Europe and uh, were raised in, you know, European countries, but still are affected by this phenomenon. I mean, they grow in enclaves, Muslim enclaves in European cities. In those enclaves, you can find Muslims who do not have any work, who are not integrated into the European uh, society, who feel that, you know, they are not part of Europe, that the government ignore them and neglect them, and that's basically the reason why such people have the motivation to join ISIS. Uh, I guess it's possible to find people who uh, sympathize or express support. I mean, because nowadays it's being done through, you know, all these uh, 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 public media, internet, uh, email messages, Facebook. Okay, so in some of the cases, not all of the cases, in some of the cases you can see that somebody is uh, expressing support for, for ISIS, uh, but that's it. I mean, uh, the decision to join ISIS is sometimes, you know, a uh, decision made by an individual against a specific background and it's impossible to know when and why and how, how come. ISIS made it very clear that he is after the United States and carrying out attack American soil, it's a question of time. Uh, how to meet the challenge, how to contain this threat and deal with this threat, it's a serious question, but I guess that's what the organization is uh, after, and I guess that that's what the Americans try, are trying now to prevent or to avoid by, by attacking, by, by bombing, by containing the organization, because if you let him continue, and touch eventually, like in the case of Bin Laden in Afghanistan, he might carry out such an, uh, such an attack. But the real solution is to eliminate this, to recapture these areas and to fight uh, ISIS till the end, but that's not practical right now. Uh, the Americans they are after ISIS, that's the main problem. For Russia, it's more complicated. Of course, they are worried about uh, ISIS, but they want also to secure the position of Bashar. 
they have uh, their own concerns uh, regarding the United States. I mean, uh, our, uh, this intervention in, Russia, in, in, in Syria is not aimed only at uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Clearly, the, uh, the leader of ISIS, clearly the idea was to send a message to Obama, who is the boss. Putin is, is the boss. So the Russian position is more complicated, and they are not only after ISIS, they are after many other uh, targets as, uh, as well. That's why we see some, uh, um, well, some sort of a careful dialogue between, uh, limited dialogue between the Americans and the Russian, but there is no real uh, cooperation because the Russian came to Syria, they said now uh, after ISIS, but uh, uh, at, at the meantime, they are bombing uh, targets uh, which belong to uh, moderate rebels. So that's clearly not what the Americans want them to do. Clearly, it's very dangerous to wait and see, because uh, by waiting and not interfering, you might uh, allow uh, ISIS to spread all over. But, but then to interfere, against who? What are your targets? Uh, it's very risky, very stupid to send your troops uh, to a country where there is such a uh, bloody civil uh, war and everybody will start shooting at your uh, soldiers. So clearly there is no answer to this question and uh, I don't know whether Israel is an answer as for uh, what is good for Israel, I mean, to have Bashar in power, to have the rebels in, uh, in uh, power. At least Bashar is the devil we know. Uh, he kept the border quiet. With ISIS, it's much more problematic. At least Bashar, we can deter Bashar. There is a clear balance between Israel and, uh, and, and, and clear understanding. With ISIS, it's a big, uh, it's a big unknown. But then, uh, should we interfere and fight against who? Against ISIS? By fighting ISIS, we help Bashar, the Iranians, Hezbollah. So the best thing to do is not to interfere and uh, uh, keep uh, sitting on the border. Uh, we saw it already with Al-Qaeda. You know, Al-Qaeda spoke about the Americans, about the Israelis, but they, mainly, they were mainly after uh, the Shiites, and they killed more Shiites than they killed Israelis and Americans even if we take into consideration the 9-11 uh, tragic uh, events. I mean, uh, the hatred between these two groups is enormous. And for ISIS, Hezbollah is more dangerous and uh, more problematic than uh, Israel. The Israelis are Jews, but who are the uh, Hezbollah people? I mean, the are Shia. It's even worse in the eyes of ISIS. We know that, you know, Muslim communities, when the uh, immigrants settle uh, the second generation, you know, because what does it mean to be a Muslim in Europe? Usually the common denom uh, denominator is to support Palestinians, so I don't think that we can earn anything. This is, but uh, clearly it's a serious problem for the Europeans. We speak about potential 10 million immigrants, because, you know, 10 million Syrians were forced to leave their houses. 8 million became refugees outside. Uh, outside Syria, so it's a serious challenge for Europe, and I don't know whether s Europe has a, a real answer. Well, well, the Druze are loyal to the Syrian regime because it's a regime based on the support of minority communities against the Islamic uh, extremists, so they are with the regime. But ISIS is already there, you know, in some parts of the uh, Druze mountains where the Druze live, and they have doubts whether the regime can support them and help them in the long run. So they are looking for, you know, the Druze mentality and the Druze uh, tradition is never uh, to leave your land. Uh, that, that, that's against their... So, so the idea is to stay where they are and to look for uh, international support or for somebody who can uh, back them. The Jordanians, maybe the Israelis, yes, of course, if they uh, come to a point where they have no other um, alternative, they might come to Israel, they might come to Jordan, but, you know, the priority is given to defend themselves in 
the Mount Rose. This is the historical homeland for the last 1,000 years. And with Israeli or Jordanian support, they can do well against ISIS. Clearly, you know, in the 90s, we spoke about Pax Americana. We said that, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and now the Americans are to play a role. Clearly, the America is weak or tired, and Obama has no interest in engaging in the problems of this region, so Putin is coming. But then the question, I mean, in the long run, whether Putin can really uh, play, or he is playing a role, no, no doubt about it. But let, let us give him, you know, a year, two years in this uh, in Russia and in, in Syria and see uh, uh, where this uh, involvement in a bloody civil war will, will take uh, Russia. I have doubts about his ability to play a major, uh, a major role. Uh, Mark Weitzman, I'm Director of Government Affairs for the Simon Wiesenthal Center. If we look at today's world, there are some interesting, I don't know if I would say exact parallels because I'm really hesitant to jump in and say that, you know, we're experiencing the rise of, of the Third Reich again. Um, I think there are, particularly in the West, though, cases where we find that things that, that we thought were um, no longer acceptable after Nazi Germany after the 30s and 40s, such as economic boycotts of Jews and Jewish institutions are now becoming acceptable in certain areas. Um, and obviously I'm talking about the BDS movement, uh, which is an attempt to uh, totally delegitimize and, and economically strangle the state of Israel. Uh, so an interesting, one, one interesting thing that came out, I think just uh, very recently, past day or two even, was the French Supreme Court ruled that BDS is illegal in France because it's discriminatory. It targets one group, one nationality, one religion, um, and picks them out of, you know, separates them from, from, from the general populace, so to speak, um, and targets them individually, or, or as a group in this case, and thus is discriminatory and thus is illegal. Um, so that's an important step because if, if more countries recognize the discriminatory nature of BDS, the, the harmful and hateful nature of BDS, the anti-Semitic nature of BDS, um, maybe more will take steps about it. But it's clearly, for, for someone like Roger Waters, um, to single out Israel is hypocritical, is blind, or there's a political agenda behind it, and that could include anti-Semitism as well. The only, the, the place that I'll say, and we, we discussed Holocaust denial a little bit earlier, um, the place where Holocaust denial is still acceptable and in, quote, the mainstream in some ways is obviously the, the hardcore parts of the uh, Arab world and Muslim world in some ways, uh, with Iran leading the way in that, where Holocaust denial is part of national policy. It's part of the government's, you know, uh, basic core system and belief system and appears to be part of the policy there. And, and I'm sure it's part of the driving force of their ideology. Um, there are elements, obviously, in the Palestinian world that have embraced hardcore Holocaust denial. Um, so we see it there, unlike in the West, as, not, as being in the center sometimes, not marginalized. It's interesting, the, the question, so we have the situation in Europe right now, and, and this, by the way, puts everything that we have said earlier, um, it's a huge question mark to it, because the face of Europe is changing as we speak, demographically, socially, the influx of refugees, a million, or more than a million, um, coming in so rapidly to a Europe that's totally unequipped to handle it can change everything. Um, and one of my fears right now is that if last year anti-Semitism was the buzzword in Europe and the issue to be addressed, six months later, that may be pushed off the front burner by the, the, the refugee crisis. Um, that becomes the issue to be addressed. And one of the things that I want to do is position, um, and I'm pushing, we have the, the next IRA meeting that I'm, um, next week I'm going to Hungary for it, and I want to push to make sure that the Europeans, when they talk about integrating this population into Europe, take into account latent and overt anti-Semitism, and the fact that they, if, if Europe claims that anti-Semitism is unacceptable, then part of the integration process has to significantly deal with the issue of anti-Semitism in the migrant community, um, in the refugee community, um, 
has to teach about the Holocaust and the impact and the effect that it has and why anti-Semitism through the Holocaust and up to its most modern forms of BDS and so on is unacceptable for anyone who wants to live and be part of the European society. So that's one of the tasks I think that is very important for us moving forward is making sure that the current crisis doesn't overwhelm you know, the, the previous crisis uh, and that uh, the issue of anti-Semitism continues to be a high priority for European leaders. Um, it was interesting, the, the, uh, that survey, the, uh, survey that I referenced earlier about education but the Holocaust in the UK pointed out that Muslim students there um, were open to learning about the Holocaust. They did not turn away from it. But there may be, I'm not sure if that's totally good news, because it may be the, the way the Holocaust was taught did not force Muslim students to grapple with the issue of current anti-Semitism, let's say. It may have been taught as a you know, old past history happening someplace else that has no impact on us today. And if it doesn't have an effect of helping to shape the way people perceive Jews, Judaism, and anti-Semitism, then it's a failure. There's a huge range of diversity in how the Holocaust is, is, is approached in the Muslim world. Um, and first of all, one of the things we have to remember that the Muslim world is not only the Middle East. Um, the bulk of the Muslims do not even live in the Middle East. They live in, in Asia, Southwest Asia and so on, in Asia. Uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, places like that. India, obviously. Um, and I think our ideas of, 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 of uh, the Muslim world are shaped very often by the Middle East, but that's not necessarily how they perceive themselves. Um, in the Middle East alone, you have a range ranging from the hardcore Holocaust denial of the um, Iranians. Um, we know that years ago, uh, Abbas wrote a, his PhD dissertation in, for a Russian university. Um, that was essentially a Holocaust denial document. He has since disavowed that and, and, and um, acknowledged the presence of the Holocaust. Um, there are intellectuals in some of the uh, Muslim countries that, that are not only dealing or, or not only uh, talking about the Holocaust but dealing with it. Um, I was at a conference in Turkey about uh, a year or two ago on Holocaust education and there was a professor there from Al-Quds University in Jerusalem from an old prominent Muslim family, Palestinian family, who was teaching his students about the Holocaust and he came to meet with Jewish um, and non-Jewish experts on the Holocaust from the U.S., from Israel, from Yad Vashem, from uh, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center and others, and, and he shared his equals. Um, the downside of that story was after some of his writings and statements became public, he was fired from his position at Al-Quds University um, in Jerusalem, but he is still, uh, this was his position, he was willing to put himself on the line for that. Um, there's a Muslim community in the United States as well, where people, um, reject Holocaust denial. Uh, there's a Muslim scholar who heads a center for Holocaust and genocide studies um, at a university, as a matter of fact, at a Catholic university in, in the States. And she does excellent work on talking and teaching both the Muslim community about the Holocaust and um, the non-Muslim community about Muslim uh, perceptions and feelings related to it. Um, so it's very difficult to make a monolithic statement, but again, we know that there's a hardcore from Iran, from certain of the, the Wahhabi circles and certain of the you know, Islamist circles that are both hardcore Holocaust deniers, and then there are some also from those circles who, in a sense, try to follow the path laid out by the Mufti, um, which is acknowledging that the Holocaust took place and wishing to join it. There were some of the um, attempts to, to create sort of a bridge between American far-right neo-Nazi and Holocaust denying groups and similar-minded in, in the Muslim and Arab world. Um, so far they haven't really succeeded much, but there have been points of contact and uh, attempts to, to share influences and join together as well. When Bibi Netanyahu spoke about the Mufti, I, I, I have to say that we understood, I understood where, what he wanted to accomplish, which was what we would call a teaching moment in a sense, to talk about uh, how the, the, the uh, 
Mufti had participated and endorsed genocidal anti-Semitism and that that was still existing in the world today, so on. But the reality is that his comment was off base historically. Um, Adolf Hitler did not learn genocidal anti-Semitism from the Mufti. Adolf Hitler had no idea who the Mufti was when he was developing his genocidal anti-Semitism. We at the uh, Wiesenthal Center obtained a letter that Hitler had written in, I think it was 1919, immediately after his discharge, um, where he talked, I think it was one of the first expressions of his overt anti-Semitism. It's on display in our museum in Los Angeles. Um, and this was a clear statement decades before he ever met the Mufti, and I'm sure before he ever heard of the Mufti, when he was you know, still in Munich as, as a low, I think he was a police informer at that time, or, or whatever he was at that time. Um, and so the, the historical evidence and record seems pretty clear. Um, the Mufti did not bring Hitler to anti-Semitism and genocide, um, but the Mufti's willingness to jump in on it and ride that bandwagon still resonates in certain areas in the radical Islamist world. Yehuda Bauer, the great Israeli historian of the Holocaust, has described the Holocaust as unprecedented, meaning that, not that it's, it's unique in the sense that it happened once and will never happen again, but the way that it was created was unprecedented. Um, but he himself has said that there were other instances of genocide beforehand, um, and clearly, and we know unfortunately, tragically, other instances afterwards. Um, one of the things, one of the precursors in many ways that we talk about was what happened to the Armenians. Um, and in a sense, it's a double tragedy, or I'll even say a triple tragedy. It's the initial tragedy that obviously was the genocide of the Armenians. The second tragedy is Turkey's refusal to recognize it over years, um, which has denied the Armenians the, uh, just the historical, um, I'm not even gonna say closure, but just clarity on, on the issue. Um, the third is that it's a tragedy for Turkey itself because the Turks' denial, blind denial and, and, and rigid denial, um, have painted them into a corner where they have, and I know this, I mean, I've, I've been in places where, and I've been to, to Istanbul a, a number of times over the past few years, um, working both with the Turkish Jewish community and, and Turkish government officials and so on, um, and they really, it would be to their benefit, and I pointed out to them, and how much journey, which, which was on a more massive scale in a sense, um, accomplished by coming to grips with its past, and how no one today holds Germans today responsible on a personal level for what happened. There's an historical responsibility and a national responsibility, um, but not on the individual level. Turkey, I mean, uh, Germany today is, is Israel's greatest friend in, in, in the West, in, in, of Europe, in all of Europe. Um, Turkey can accomplish similar things if they want it, but it requires moving past this blind spot that has isolated them and I think put them in a negative light in many, in many parts of the world. Um, so I hope they do acknowledge it. I hope they do open up their archives. Um, if they do, I think they'll find many people willing to work with them, both who um, it can, it can bring the experience of having worked through um, the Holocaust and other genocides, um, but it will also make them people more open and willing to work with them. But right now, to be blunt, Turkey is a difficult country because the uh, ruling party, the ruling government, has had some, especially in terms of Jews, for example, um, not only in terms of Armenians, but in terms of Jews, has had some really radically, um, there's no other way to describe it, than anti-Semitic statements. Um, the Turkish Jewish community is living on edge there. Um, it's a volatile situation. There was just a major terrorist attack. Um, and Turkey has a lot that it needs to straighten out. It has immense potential to be a force for, for you know, positive um, action moving forward, serving as a bridge between the Muslim and the European worlds, uh, being a country that had in the past a history of warm relationships with Israel. Um, good relationships with the U.S. Uh, there's so much that Turkey can contribute to the world today, um, but right now its, its leadership has kept it, in a sense, isolated on, on certain levels by its radicalism, by its anti-Semitism, 
and, uh, and I hope that that changes. All right, I want to add something. One of the things that we did, uh, we talked about the BDS and the isolation of Israel. Um, a couple of years ago, when the uh, UNESCO voted to admit the Palest uh, Palestine, and there was the automatic checkoffs that went off in Congress, which, which shut down uh, a lot of the U.S. contribution to UNESCO. Um, our leadership went to UNESCO because we had a long-standing relationship with them. Uh, they had sponsored a number of conferences with us in the past. Um, I edited a, uh, a memorial volume of essays in memory of Simon Wiesenthal that UNESCO co-published. And we basically spoke to them about the difficulty that they had put themselves in with this issue. And the uh, Director General of UNESCO, uh, Madame Makova, um, agreed with us that we would do a joint project, a historical exhibition of the 3,500 year history of the connection between the land of Israel and the people of Israel. Um, so it was called People Land Book, the 3,500 year history. Um, and it was supposed to open in UNESCO about a year and a half ago. The day that it was being hung to be open, the Arab bloc all of a sudden realized and complained, and it was stopped. Now you have to understand the background for this. This was, the text was written by the late uh, Robert Wistrich um, from Hebrew University. He was one of the great historians of, of modern Jewish history, um, one of my close friends. And he said, he considered this one of the, as a matter of fact, it's the last talk that he gave before he died. He said he considered this effort one of his two or three most important works. Um, and it was vetted by UNESCO's historians. Robert told me that the, the, the discussions back and forth, the degree of, of, of you know, inquiry was, he said, the worst he had felt uh, faced since his doctoral dissertation defense. Um, but it gone through, it was accepted, it went up, and then after all that, it was pulled. Um, UNESCO realized they made a mistake. There was a political fallout, public fallout. Um, there were a lot of negotiations that went on um, between various parties and it was finally put back and exhibited um, about a year ago June at UNESCO's headquarters in Paris for, uh, for I'm not sure if it was six weeks to month, whatever but it went up for a period of time and it was exhibited successfully there. Last spring I got it into the UN. It was exhibited in the lobby of the United Nations here in New York and it was put in front of the delegates entry to the General Assembly so that every delegate that walked into the General Assembly had to pass it. The opening was attended by uh, some Ambassador Samantha Power spoke, Ron Prosor, who was then Israel's ambassador, spoke. The Canadian ambassador spoke. There was a message from Madame Bakova. Um, and, and it was significant that it was there. Um, and it's opening next, uh, in two weeks, in the Capitol in Washington um, under the sponsorship of Congressman Ed Royce, who was the uh, chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, House Foreign Relations Committee, and Elliot Engel, who's the ranking minority member there. Um, and the importance of it is that we talked about Holocaust distortion earlier. There is another form of distortion that, that's important, and, and it's sometimes outright denial. And that's the attempt to separate um, Israel, the land of Israel, from its historical Jewish context um, and connection. The most recent was the attempt at UNESCO to brand the Western Wall, the Kotel, as a Muslim site. And that has happened with other places as well. Um, it was beaten back at UNESCO, partially through the intervention of, of the director generals running for direct head of the, uh, running for secretary general of the UN as well now. Our term is up at, at UNESCO. Um, but she put herself on the line in terms of this a little bit. And, uh, and that, that's you know, important to acknowledge and know um, that it was, and so it was beaten back there. Um, but we saw it when, um, a couple of years ago, when, when Abbas spoke at the General Assembly, for example, he talked about the, 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 the land of Israel, the holy land, be the, 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 you know, the root and, uh, and source of major religions such as Islam and Christianity, and not a word about Judaism in there. This is an ongoing effort to de-Judaize the land of Israel. Um, and as such, it's a new form of historical distortion and denial that I think is going to continue to be one of the, and maybe take on more and more importance. Because if the roots can be severed and the connection broken, then enemies of the existence of Israel see it as a strong um, weapon in their attempt to delegitimize the the Jewish state. It's even gone to the extreme where some uh, Palestinians and their supporters 
have claimed that the Beit HaMikdash, the temple, did, did not exist on Harabayat, on, on, on the, you know, on the mount there. Um, despite, the, despite the wall that is, that is there now, um, and that's one of the reasons why some of the archaeological, or often a lot of the archaeological work is, uh, they attempt to ban and, and prevent it, um, because they see it as undermining their effort, again, to destroy the historical connection between Jews and, and the land of Israel. Um, so this has become, history has become a political weapon. It, it always was in many ways, but right, right now it's, it's a high intensity political weapon. And we're seeing it play out in many ways in UNESCO, in, in archaeology. And uh, I think that this is one of the most important areas that people don't necessarily pay much attention. Who's going to sit down and read warring historians and warring archaeologists? Um, but the reality is, in this case, it has a major primetime political impact and needs to be, attention needs to be paid to it. And, and, and that's one of the things that we're trying to do with this ex exhibition that I mentioned. Thank you.